This is a Kingdom Cassette service recording produced by the Federation of the Covenant People, P.O. Box 830, Honeydew 2040, South Africa. This is the 69th recording in the Kingdom Cassette service. And in this, we offer a variation in our presentation in that, over the next four, five, or possibly even six months, we will be joined by Israel identity believers from all over the Anglo-Saxon world in a general theme which I have called In Search of Truth. We today are living at a time which is prophetically described as the times of the nation. In our authorized version of the Bible, it is written as the times of the Gentiles. And if we examine the context in which this phrase occurs, uh, we see that it is a time when non-Israel nations are in the ascendancy, which is precisely, of course, what we have in the world of today. There was, of course, a time when the Anglo-Saxon nations were the guiding influence in the world. But because of national blindness and a willingness to endow the Edomite adversary with our Israel identity, we have been maneuvered into two world wars, which resulted in the creation of the United Nations Organization, which in turn has become the World Forum, through which Esau Edom has created the means for the ascendancy of all the non-Israel nations in the world. From the United Nations organization has come that general babble of demands of people who, prior to the creation of the world body, had absolutely no concept whatsoever of nationhood, and whose various ramifications have stripped the true Israel people uh, of their role in world affairs. And you know, as we think on the events which have taken place over the past 20 years or so, in addition to the prophetic words of our Lord in his Olivet Discourse concerning the times of the nations, we are reminded of the words recorded by the prophet Isaiah, which I feel could relate to the present time, the time of the, the rushing of nations, the times of the nations, the time when nations are demanding their rights, their rights without earning these rights. Just listen to the words of the prophet Isaiah as he wrote them such a long time ago. Woe to the multitude of many people, which make a noise like the noise of the sea, and to the rushing of nations that make a rushing like the rushing of mighty waters. The nations shall rush like the rushing of many waters, but God shall rebuke them, and they shall flee far off, and shall be chased as the chaff of the mountains before the wind, and like a rolling thing before the whirlwind. And behold, at eventide, trouble. And before the morning, he is not. This is the portion of them that spoil us, and the lot of them that rob us. Within the context of this end of the age scene, and the babble of the newly emerged nations in the world, where, my friends, is the voice of God's covenant people, true Israel? Oh, we hear a lot from the Israeli state and its claims, not only to Israel identity, but also to the land which was promised to Abraham and to his seed, which of course should tell the average man in the street that something is wrong here, for according to the prophets, Israel would be blind to national identity until the veil of blindness would be removed from all nations, and yet the Jews have claimed a knowledge of their identity since a Judean nation was set up in Palestine in the 4th century B.C. Something is indeed awry here, for our people, the Anglo-Celto-Saxon and kindred European nations, have been rendered so inert by the opiate of theology that they fail to see that in our various nations we are living under the exact conditions which the prophet said would obtain in Israel. If we look back to the history of Israel in the land of Canaan, we see that the Lord charged that his people had been destroyed or would be destroyed through a lack of knowledge, a lack of perception of his plan and his purpose with them, a situation which would continue until a new covenant became operative in them. And it's patently obvious that the promised new covenant is not even today in operation. 
I know that a lot of people would like to challenge when I say that the new covenant is not in operation today. They would challenge us claiming that our Lord Jesus Christ initiated the promised new covenant. And my friends, notwithstanding theological arguments, I would like to ask a question here in respect of this new covenant. Firstly, who was involved in it? It simply tells you, you could find this either in Jeremiah 31, 31 through there, or in Hebrews 8, 8. Either one, it makes no difference. The new covenant was to be made with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, and there is absolutely no suggestion that anyone but Israel was involved in this. You would further note that in terms of this new covenant, the law would be written on the hearts and the minds of of the Israel people, not some other discipline, my friends, but the law which God had given to them at Sinai was to be written in the hearts and the minds of the people. Further, the operation of that new covenant, the operation of the law in the mind and the heart of the Israel people would have a consequence, cause and effect, if you wish it that way. The consequence would be, and I quote it to you, they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. Now, even the most naive among us must admit that this situation does not obtain, and that instead of being a secure, law-abiding, and wealthy nation, we are a company of nations which has lost its way in the midst of confusion, uncertainty, and an ever-increasing lawlessness. We are living a life, my friends, which is the extension of that lack of knowledge which destroyed our forebears in Canaan, and yet from all over the world, where, as we understand it, the Lord sent his people to accomplish his purpose, we find a tremendous thing beginning to develop. Within the lack of knowledge concerning God, his plan, and his purpose with the Israel people, within this lack of knowledge of all this, we have a strange stirring, almost as though the Spirit of the Lord has touched the spirit of the Israel people. And from all over, we are finding people beginning to stir from a spiritual inertia which has been engendered by the enemy action. People are beginning to say, why are we in this condition? What is happening to us? What is the answer to this situation in which we are now finding ourselves? My friends, as I see it, Isaiah's description of truth falling in the street is having a reaction. Men and women from the true Israel company of nations are beginning a searching and a seeking for an indefinable something which the spirit within knows has to be rediscovered. Now, in this series, we'll be presenting questions, comments, and viewpoints as these have been expressed by our Israel kinsfolk from all over the world. And we trust that you will enjoy the fellowship in our search for knowledge and for truth. The first of our guests in this new series is Mr. Artie McGreerty, who lectures on Israel identity as well as other law subjects relative to the United States of America. And his question is one which, which I feel many have thought over since lawlessness began to snowball in our various societies. Dr. Finley. This is Artie McBurdy of Gentry, Arkansas, U.S. of A. Now, God's law says certain specific things, and yet man for centuries has been trying to soft-pedal these specifics whenever they were in conflict with what man thought at the moment he preferred to do. So as time has gone on, it has become absolutely socially acceptable to be queer. Now, the media likes the word gay. I don't care for it because a deviant is a deviant is a deviant. And so from my youth, the word queer, Q-U-E-E-R, it still hangs forward. But I prefer in reality the word deviant because that's what God labels them. And that's the strictest word we have in the English language, to my knowledge. Now then, the deviates 
have become socially acceptable according to today's media. They get to go out and parade and admit to the world that they are violating God's law with impunity, at least in man's world. And this has been growing by leaps and bounds over the last few years. Now, it is my personal opinion that God simply says, okay, that's what you want. Remember, I told you if you do these things, I will bless you. And if you don't do these things, I will make you wish you had. In my opinion, Dr. Finley, this is God's way of showing these people that even though being a deviant is socially acceptable in man's world, it is still not acceptable in God's eye. And as a result of that, he has visited upon the deviant what we would call some of the curses of Egypt, the diseases of Egypt. And I would like your comment on this, if you would, sir. Well, now, Mr. McBeatty, I think, pinpoints the whole problem here by using an expression, socially acceptable. And, you know, I feel that we should take uh, a look at how situations and circumstances which are abhorrent uh, to the Lord via his law are now be, being transformed into the, into the in thing and has become socially respectable with no one lifting even a, a questioning eyebrow as to what is going on. In the first instance, in looking at the world of today, and here, of course, I'm speaking of the parts of the world which concern us at the moment, namely what I choose to call the Israel world, in looking at this, we see the people dividing into two areas. The first being the political area, that is, that part of our lives which is taken up with the struggle to survive in a highly competitive economic system, while the second area is our one-day-in-seven religious area, which we, generally speaking, reserve for God. Now, what I'm saying here is that, that while our society appears to be very pious on one day during the week, be it either a Saturday or a Sunday, the other six days, or the greater majority of our lives, are lived as though the, the Lord our God didn't exist at all. Somehow, somehow or other, someone has succeeded in making the Lord relevant only on one day in the week, and has emasculated him, in the thinking of the people at least, of any participation in the things which confront the individual in the pure politics of living. In a nutshell, the Lord has been transformed into a religious God, whose interest, so it is taught, lies entirely with the worship accorded him, and who, apart from this, has absolutely no interest in what men do with the rest of, the li of their lives. You see, they, are only con they say that he is only concerned with their souls. You see, under the present circumstances, God as such has become socially acceptable, in that he really makes no demands upon us and allows us to do whatever we wish, providing, of course, that it doesn't conflict with something in our minds which we today call a conscience. Now, this, of course, is the byproduct of orthodoxy ever since the days of Paul, who, having stated that the law had been nailed to the cross and having claimed that you're not under law but under grace, contended that the human conscience had become the substitute for the law of the Lord. Now, I don't have to tell you that, in general, most Christians, and, and of course Anglo-Saxons uh, profess to be Christians, most uh, Christians believe very, very sincerely that they are not under the law, but are under grace. The only discipline being recognized is that imposed by the conscience. Paul, of course, being the great advocate of this new thinking. Now, this substitution of conscience in the place of the discipline of the law of the Lord is, of course, no new thing. It has happened before. And to test whether or not this, is, uh, this situation is, is in accord with, with the wishes of the Lord, whether he approved or authorized it, we need to search the scriptures and see if there was ever a time in Israel's history when conscience and not law governed the people. Now, subsequent to the death of, of jo um, Joshua, we read that, 
there was no leader as such in Israel. And according to the record in the book of Judges, we read there that every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And this word right is translated uh, from the Hebrew yoshor, which means upright, straight, even, and just. Now, from this account, it would appear that Despite the preceding years when the law was central to the nation's existence, every man conducted his affairs as he conceived them to be equitable and just, his conscience being the only yardstick for whatever action he indulged in. Now, if we read through this book of the Judges, we are given an insight in the, into the kind of community and the type of social order which is created when a people deriving their origin from a single source, and by this, of course, I mean that they are not a heterogeneous people, that they are one people coming from a single source, when these people allow their conscience to dictate their actions. And what do we find? Apostasy, confusion, chaos, and war was the byproduct of Israel using its conscience and not the law as the yardstick for their national behavior. If we continue with the, with the Israel story, we see the Lord's response to this situation, in that we read that he appointed judges to rule over Israel and to bring the nation back under the rule of the law, which, if conscience as a rule of conduct was acceptable to him, would certainly never have been the case. Now, in returning to today, where, as I have said, God's people are encouraged to use conscience rather than the law as the, the yardstick for behavior, we find that people are indeed now doing that which is right in their own eyes. The deviates are doing their own thing because in their own minds they are exercising their, their human rights and see no wrong uh, in this at all, while society, without the discipline of uh, the law of the Lord as a yardstick, has nothing with which to counter the, the, the claimed so-called rights of the pervert to do his or her own thing. As Mr. McBrady has said, the deviates are getting bolder and bolder as society relaxes its resistance, and many people are beginning to wonder where God fits into this mess which we now call Western society. Make no mistake here. The Lord our God does not fit into it at all, and despite the theological explanations of a God of love being reconciled with man's weaknesses, we find that the, the very mechanism which the theologians maintain has been abrogated, still, my friends, very much in effect and doing precisely what the Lord said it would do if his people turned their back on the mechanism which he had given them. You will have noted that Mr. McBrady spoke of the curses and the diseases of Egypt cropping up again and again. And you know, if we compare what is happening in our lands today with what went on when Israel was in Egypt, we see that we are indeed reliving the same experience which obtained in those days, a political experience, economical experience, and the health experience that they had in those days. Some, of course, may say, well, this, this is pure coincidence. But, you know, if we look at just about every facet in our everyday lives, we see that there are just too many of these so-called coincidences, all of which go to prove that the Lord our God was not fooling when, through Moses, he gave our forebears the principles of life and good and demanded that his people should abide by these, and in being blessed by obedience to it, they would then fulfill their national function in the earth. So then, in commenting on, on what Mr. McBrady said, he said, do we think that we are living through the times of the Egyptian experience all over again, the curses, uh, both health-wise and politically-wise, that this is happening to us again? I say, yes, I do feel that this is exactly what has happened. And the more one goes into it, the more one researches life today as it was in the days of Egypt, it's a significant feature that we, the modern development of true Israel, are experiencing everything that our forebears in Egypt experienced. Are we not today becoming 
being uh, subjected to a totalitarian rule. Our governments, while claiming to be democratic, are certainly not. They are authoritarian. When we look at our health, is not our health exactly the same as it was in the days of Egypt? And just look at the socialism that went on in Egypt. The pharaoh bought out or just simply took out every bit of land, took out every man's property, and he ruled them with a rod of iron. Isn't this exactly what is going on today? The more you search this, the day, today's happenings, you will see that we are indeed reliving that experience. And so my comment in terms of uh, this question is, yes, sir, we certainly are living through those days and experiencing the curses of political Egypt. We are experiencing the curses of spiritual Egypt, and we are certainly experiencing all the diseases of Egypt in our midst today. Now, Mr. McBrady included a second question uh, with that which I, I've just commented on, and which is related to it, and has to do with the, the current outbreak of this uh, disease called AIDS and its impact on our society. But let's hear his question before I go any further commenting on it. In addition to this, Dr. Finley, it's become known through the media, of course, that AIDS is transmittable to normally healthy uh, straight type folks, the good old uh, heterosexual as the word goes, and uh, it comes to them via the, we believe, blood transfusion. Yet the fact remains that uh, an individual who's not indulging in the deviant game can still catch this particular undesirable disease. Now again, it's my personal opinion that uh, people who are not deviant can uh, partake of some of the punishment because they were part of the socially accepting public. I'd like your comment on that, sir. Oh, well now, in, in dealing with this subject, I'd like to divide my comments into two sections. The first one uh, in the context of the collective responsibility, and the second in respect of this, this new thing called AIDS, or the Acquired Immunodeficiency Syndrome. In the first point, I would like us to take another look at where we stand. And you know, when you boil the whole thing down, I would like to say that all of us every one of us, are accessories both before and after the fact, in that, in defiance of the law of the Lord, we allow the deviates to practice their perversions in our society, whereas, according to the directive of the Lord, all such perverts should be put to death. But, of course, we don't do that today, do we? We have a lot of sympathy which has been directed in the line of the perpetrator of evil rather than in the victim of evil. Just take your death penalty, for instance. What has happened there? Everyone is totally sympathetic uh, to the murderer. And what about the victim and, and his family? Or what about the young children who have been deprived of a father, for instance? Or what about the cost to us today to keep this murderer alive, to house him in, in pretty good conditions, to feed him and then allow him to go out at a later stage and then commit murder all over again? Oh, yes, we don't like the thought of putting people to death today. But, my friends, the Lord said that all those perverters of justice, those perverters of the human body, they should be put to death. And that is the end of the story. But, no, we are too, too um, sophisticated. My gosh, if you want to look at that word, go and look what it says in the dictionary, how that word is defined in your dictionary. No, we are too sophisticated today. After all said and done, we are more human than God was, not so. Because we permit the sodomite in our society and accord him or her human rights in their subhuman behaviors, all of us, my friends, both the deviates and ourselves, are collectively victims of a fear. The deviates, from the fear of death, there, of course, is apparently no known cure for AIDS, and ourselves fear of possible contagion from this disease. 
You see, what is happening now is we do not know when this thing is going to strike next. There are so many stories that are floating around, and a little bit of panic is now reaching us. I read in Time magazine some time ago that there was a situation of fear developing throughout the whole of the United States because of this. Innocent and the guilty could be struck down by AIDS without anyone having any hope of recovery. Now, you know, I, I find this very significant. If you turn to Leviticus 26, listen to what the Lord had to say. If ye will not hearken unto me, and will not do all my commandments, and if ye shall despise my statutes, or if your soul abhor my judgments, so that ye will not do all my commandments, but that ye break my covenant, I will do this unto you. I will even appoint over you terror. Now, don't we have terror in our midst today? And significantly, when you look at this word, this English word, terror, you see that it is translated from the Hebrew word, beholor which literally means panic. And have we not again read that AIDS is creating panic among the people? This, my friends, is precisely what the Lord said would happen. And in our socially accepting public, we are collectively paying the price of fear for allowing the perverts in our midst. It wasn't so before it is happening now, because somehow or other, some disease is now striking through them, and which is suggested as being highly contagious, and all of us now could be victims at any given moment in time. Now, having said this, I'd like to spend a few moments on the story of age. Uh, because, you know, there is much more to this story than meets the eye. And I personally feel that it has a message for God's people today which far transcends this social implication. If you will bear with me, just for a few moments, I would like to draw a little bit of a background story which will lead us into this extra uh, addition uh, to the AIDS story, which I see very, very clearly in my mind as being one of the problems which confronts us today. So just bear with me for a moment, will you? Because I would like to go back and deal with the story of Israel in the land. I see, before we can do this, I see that we're coming to the end of uh, this side of the recording. So I must ask you at this stage, please turn this cassette over and continue with this recording on the other side. And I am sure that you will find that that which we have to say about AIDS uh, will be more than just an, a comment on what Mr. McBrady has said. Uh, it will be like a ray of understanding about how far we have gone in terms of our deviations uh, from the law of the law. Now, if we go back to the giving of the law at Sinai and the re-giving of it just prior to Israel's entry into the land of Canaan, we see that one command runs through and is very persistent in the context of obedience, and that is for Israel to remain separate from other people. Now, of course, some may wonder why I have introduced that subject here. But if you'll bear with me, I hope to show that there is a definite linkage between this outbreak of AIDS and the integration policies which are throwing all people into one common melting pot. Now, if we look at the law, among the many regulations which, which are not considered as, as Christian, we find that the Lord was very specific as to who could be incorporated as a member of the Israel community and who could not. Unfortunately, our English translation blurred over these distinctions and used one English word as the equivalent of four different Hebrew words. We find those Hebrew words being Zer, Nokri, Toshab, and Zer, and their meaning is invariably determined by the context, which all can check out if they wish. Now, if we look at the various words, we certainly see that the word je was a type of person who was permitted full Israel rights. The Nokri, which generally covered such people as the Canaanites, the Moabites, and the Ammonites, these had no rights whatsoever and were classified as the Mamza or the Bastard, as this is referred to in Deuteronomy 23, verse 2. 
the toshab which is a comparatively late word covered a people whose only right as far as the scripture says was that in respect of justice while the fourth and final word zur covered peoples such as racial aliens who were forbidden within the israel community the one english word stranger has been used to cover all these four words and their meanings and because we read it as such in our bibles we say that stranger merely means one that you are not familiar with that is all the hebrew has an entirely different story to tell and it makes specific uh, regulations uh, concerning who could and who could not come into and be a uh, part and parcel of the israel community now if we read through the old uh, testament history we see that contagion religious cultural and physical was the underlying a breakdown in the implementation of these restrictions uh, eventually led to israel's removal into captivity the fact that both isaiah and hosea wrote of the zur uh, permeating both israel's land and society and being apparently acceptable uh, to the israel people is a clear indication i feel that they had been conned that is the israel people had been conned by both their religious and their political leaders and despite what the law had to say they saw absolutely no harm in the presence of those prohibited aliens in their midst now we today are in exactly the same situation and are seeing our anglo-saxon society changed into a very heterogeneous one now in the light of what i have just said it would be natural for you to ask whether i see the aids disease as the byproduct of the intermingling of people of different cultures rather than as a byproduct of a sodomy and my friends because of evidence to hand i must admit that i do the fact that sodomites constitute 71 per cent of all known aids cases is a significant link which shows where the disease strikes where it, stri where it strikes first but i do not think that this perversion itself is the source of aids now let me give you my reasons for this statement and the first is to draw your attention to the fact that sodomy has been going on for a very very long time long before it was given social respectability by a permissive society and yet prior to 1978 or 1979 the acquired immunodeficiency syndrome was totally unknown now what in fact i am saying here is that homosexuality is old aids is very new which means that something has been introduced and which for some strange reason has struck at the perverted section of our society and this something my friends must be isolated so that we can determine precisely what it is that is creating more than a little panic in the western world in the beginning the trail seemed to lead to haiti and i'm sure that you'll all recall that the haitians became as popular as the proverbial pig in the synagogue particularly as the trail seemed to end there as far as america was concerned however aids began to make its appearance in western europe with france reporting 39 cases with four out of every five never having been to either the united states or haiti and it was still thought that those who had been had introduced it into france however belgium uh, put the proverbial cat among the pigeons when it announced that they had 35 reported uh, cases none of whom had had any contact with those in france but all of whom had contact with equatorial africa according to a news agency report the first aids case in belgium was a zairean woman who had married a white belgium she died of the disease in 1981. Since then, and, and with persistent investigation, it has been shown, and as is quoted in the March 26th edition of the medical journal The Lancet, Zaire is an endemic zone for the supposed infectious agents of this disease. The significant feature about this is that Zaire, which is quoted as an endemic zone uh, for the infectious agents of this uh, disease that zaire is not my friends known for its homosexuality nor for its 
drug users, the two high-risk elements among the Europeans. Now, unfortunately, I don't have the number of AIDS victims in Britain, but I heard on a, a radio news item that 13 people in Britain had died from this disease, with a similar number of deaths in France. Now, if we look at Western Europe, we see that Britain, France, and Belgium had colonies in equatorial Africa. And as we know, the political climate in each of these countries is such that immigrants from their former colonies have, until just recently, been very, very welcome. Now, I ask the question, and I'll leave it uh, for you, and, and possibly the medical experts to answer in the future. I ask the question, is AIDS a double warning by the Lord of the consequences of continued national rejection of his commands concerning the alien and concerning a social permissiveness which accords respectability to that which the Lord himself calls an abomination. Thank you, Mr. McBerty, for, for your questions, and I trust that, that my comments here will have been helpful. Now, I have at least ten other questions from kinsfolk uh, all over uh, the United States. But I feel that I would like to swing across the Atlantic uh, to the United Kingdom in this particular instance, uh, which, in, in common with all modern Israel nations, is crippled with lawlessness. And by this, of course, I mean lawlessness in respect of the law of the Lord. Now, let us just listen to a question which I have received from the United Kingdom, and it is a question from a lady uh, whom a lot of us know, and I'm sure a lot of us will continue to know in the future. It's Mrs. Fletcher, and I live in stockton on Tees in England. I am an avid listener to the Kingdom cassettes, and a recent one, number 64, in the series I found extremely enlightening. And like Mr. Allen, who has a penchant for saying, explain please, Dr. Finlay, I have a questioning mind, and there is much I would like to ask of you, please, Dr. Finlay. In view of the British government's recent no-hanging vote, in other words, a big no to capital punishment, which was so obviously against the will of Her Majesty's peoples, at least the majority of them, it seemed to me that the British so-called democratic government did as its predecessors did. It bent over backwards to ensure that no physical harm should come to the perpetrators of vicious and horrible crimes. It is hardly believable that in a so-called Christian, which I put in inverted commas, Britain today, women and children of Anglo-Saxon stock are at the mercy of the sodomite, the rapist, the thief, or the murderer, who have all by now received the message loud and clear that their license to kill has been endorsed by a conservative government. Two ghastly wars which filled the pockets of bank books of black marketeers actually robbed and deprived Anglo-Saxon, Celtic and kindred women of both provider and protector of themselves and their families, leaving them at the mercy of con men drug peddler, rapist, murderer, mugger. A locked door, Dr. Finlay, is hardly protection against those determined, it seems, on the deliberate corruption of white children and the destruction of white women. The plight of women, in particular widows, in 1983, in a so-called Christian, again in inverted commas, country, is an absolute disgrace. Even the stranger brought into Britain is not treated with as little concern as that shown to widows and orphans of the brave young men who are either dead, missing, or maimed for life, who believed it. They really believed it when they were told that they were fighting for a better life, freedom and all that. Can you tell me, please, Dr. Finlay, just what is the law of the Lord concerning widows, in Israel? I am prompted to ask this question because of something a young Dutchman said to me recently, which brought to mind the numbers of lonely women, defenseless women in this country today. He was on his travels by motorbike 
to England to Scotland and he was puzzled by the numbers of elderly women who either sat about or walked in twos or threes or even alone and I said but didn't he realize that these were either war widows or women whose sweethearts were killed during two world wars his immediate reaction was to say oh but Dutch ladies all had their husbands English women have de been deprived of theirs. Well now, Mrs. Fletcher's question, as with that by Mr. McGretty, should I feel be, be seen against the same background, namely our national disregard for the law which our God gave to his people at Sinai? Mrs. Fletcher's statement, and you know, I want to quote her words again. Even the stranger brought into Britain is not treated with as little concern as that shown to the widows and the orphans or the brave young men who are either dead, missing, or maimed for life, is, my friends, to my way of thinking, the degree of our national disobedience to the directives of the Lord our God. In the first place, the stranger to Mrs. Fletcher was referring is, of course, the immigrants from Britain's former colonies, the majority of whom are coloured, and notwithstanding the political platitudes and the emotional vaporings were about responsibility to those countries, the law of the Lord is quite emphatic that they should not be in Britain at all, and under no circumstances should indigenous Britons, man, woman, or child, be discriminated against in favour of those aliens. However, when we look at our politicians, we, we are amazed. I can only say that I am amazed, because, you know, they are people of our own stock. Although in certain countries it's patently obvious that the Edomite and other non-Israel strains have wormed their way into places of authority. And as we look at our politicians, it seems unbelievable that they would indulge in legislation and other acts which would harm their own people. What incredible process has been introduced into the acts of men and women of our own stock which causes them to betray their own kind? If we look behind the scenes, as it were, we see that our politicians have surrendered uh, to the Edomite financial cartel and today are doing precisely what the leaders in Israel were doing and which led to the demise of our forebears in Canaan. Just listen, my friends. Uh, through Ezekiel the prophet, the Lord charged the leaders, and I quote, this is Ezekiel 13, Will ye pollute me among my people for handfuls of barley and for pieces of bread to slay the souls that should not die and save alive the souls that should not live by your lying to my people that hear your lies? Politics, my friends, is like a game of chess with our elected representatives as the pawns who are moved in the direction which the master planners decide is expedient. And if you're in any doubt about this, think on what happened to Rhodesia, where British kinsfolk were sold out by British parliamentarians who, from Mrs. Fletcher's description, are doing exactly the same thing to Britain today. So then, in looking at, at Mrs. Fletcher's question, the first point to note is that Ephraim Israel is showing very clearly that the birthright tribe is very far removed from the only machinery through which the nations of the world could see that Israel was designed as something other than the proverbial doormat. Being remiss in the matter of, of alien immigration, it naturally follows that other aspects of the law, too, would be conspicuous by their absence. And as we have seen in Mrs. Fletcher's question, the widows, in conjunction with others, have become the victims in this age of lawlessness. Now, in turning to the law of the Lord, and indeed to the whole tenor of the Old Testament history, we see that the fatherless and the widow occupy a very special place in the provision of the Lord. And whenever the prophets were used to communicate the indictment of the Lord against the nation, you will see, my friends, that neglect of the consideration for the fatherless and the widow is very much to the forefront. Now, if we consider Psalm 68.5, Psalm 146.9, 
Proverbs 15.25, Deuteronomy 10.18, and Jeremiah 49.11, we see that the widow was regarded as being under the, the special guardianship of the Lord. And because of this, due regard for their needs and circumstances was looked upon as a measure of the community's faithfulness to the Lord himself. Now, apart from these scriptures, I would like to draw your attention to Deuteronomy 24, 17, which reads, Thou shalt not pervert the judgment of the stranger. Well, now, I'd better break in here for a moment, because this stranger is written as Zer in the Hebrew, which is certainly not the same as Zer, which from the context in which the word is used denotes a racial alien. So then, in returning to Deuteronomy 24, 17, Thou shalt not pervert the judgment of the stranger, nor the fatherless, nor take a widow's raiment to pledge. While in Deuteronomy 27, 19, we read, Cursed be he that perverteth the judgment of the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, and all the people shall say, Amen. From these and other passages in the law, we find that the treatment of the fatherless and the widow is the very antithesis uh, to that which apparently obtains in Britain today. And if we continue to look at the law, we see that sustenance is provided for the fatherless and the widow. This is found in Deuteronomy 14.29 and Deuteronomy 26.12, where they are taught to, par to participate in the triennial tithe and are permitted to glean unmolested in the field, the olive yard and the vineyard, thus being assured that hunger would not be numbered among the problems which they had to face. As far as communal activity was concerned, the widow and the fatherless were not simply um, considered as flotsam and jetsam in society. Because, you know, if we look at Deuteronomy uh, 16, verse 11, we see that there they are specifically mentioned as being included in both the communal and the national rejoicing uh, before the Lord. So the, as far as the widow is concerned, and of course her offspring, uh, we see there that they had a very, very important part, uh, important part uh, in the, the Israel people, and their place in the community was not one, uh, shall we say, of charity or anything like that. They were to be looked upon as a charge given to them uh, uh, from the hands of the Lord. So then, in summing up this question, the disregard of widows, as mentioned by Mrs. Fletcher, is, I feel, a reflection of the disregard uh, which the people as a whole have for the Lord. For we should remember that, according to the word of God, the widow, the fatherless, and the stranger were of particular concern to the Lord, and Israel's treatment of these was considered as the national barometer of the people's faithfulness to him. My friends, in this recording, we have answered three questions. There are so many more. The people are asking, 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 searching, 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 analyzing and analyzing. The time is now for us to all search for the truth. And my friends, I tell you, I believe that the Lord is going to answer our prayer. What is truth, Lord? And as we go on in this series, I will be dealing with questions that have been asked by all our Israel kinsfolk all over the world. I have at this moment a minimum of 30 questions all on tape, and I will be dealing with these in our tapes from now and over the next six months. May the Lord our God bless you, my friends, in your search as you join with us in seeking that machinery the truth which will indeed make us free.